Rondout Never Sinks Dream Program presents its sixth annual Angler Symposium in Claryville, New York, November 1st, 2019, featuring Andrew Reinman on snow-covered forests, ecological impacts across seasons, recorded by Silver Hollow Audio. All right, thank you very much. Can everybody hear me okay if I don't use the microphone? Yeah, great. Um, well, thank you for inviting me here. Hopefully an hour from now, you don't regret just asking a stranger to come through the door and, and talk to you. Um, but it's wonderful for me to have a great opportunity on a Friday to come up to the Catskills instead of going to, to Harlem. So I can never pass up that sort of opportunity. Um, and so, uh, and to have an excuse to talk about snowpack and, and how this sort of translates across seasons. Um, I guess a little bit about my background. So I'm a terrestrial person. I don't really do much research in streams, but all these things are connected, and so I hope to kind of highlight some of those linkages today. Uh, my background's in forest ecology. I do a lot of work understanding how things like climate change and urbanization and forest fragmentation and other uh, aspects of land cover change impact um, sort of forest growth and the way they sequester carbon and the way they cycle nu uh, nutrients like nitrogen through the, through the system. Um, and for the last 10 years or so, a big part of the research that I do has been specifically to try to understand how changes in, in winter climate in the sort of in uh, the northeastern U.S., particularly areas that have seasonal snowpack, um, how those changes in snowpack might impact forest ecosystems in ways that sort of we don't tend to really think about, right? When we hear about climate change, we think about heat waves, we think about drought, we don't really think about you know, how th changes in the winter might actually impact the overall health of our systems. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, but a big part of what I do is trying to change slides. <laughs> oh, there we go, right. That makes, that makes, that makes sense. Um, so a lot of what I do is, is really centered around trying to get a better understanding of how a variety of different human activities alter the carbon cycle. And um, if, you're, if you're not familiar broadly with the carbon cycle, then this is like going to be a two-minute primer for uh, a big reason why I think this is important. So um, on this figure, what I'm showing is everything above zero is a source of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, right? And this is primarily through burning fossil fuels and through land cover change, right? So when we clear an area of forest, uh, oftentimes, especially in the tropics or even in, in areas that are getting cleared for development, that wood, that timber that was there that has a lot of carbon in it either gets burned and all that CO2 goes up into the atmosphere or gets chipped and it decomposes really quickly, right? So that's an important source of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Um, and then just like you probably do with your bank account, right? you know what money's coming in, and then you try to work out a budget to see where all that money is going. Well, we try to do the same thing with the carbon cycle. So we know all of the carbon that's going into the atmosphere, and then we want to try and figure out where it's going. Um, and so this blue area here, that's carbon that's being taken up by uh, the oceans. Um, and there's going to be a lot of numbers here. The numbers aren't so important, just the, the relative differences between them is what I want you to sort of take home. So the blue is what's getting taken up by the oceans. The green is what gets taken up by the land. And then the purple is what actually winds up accumulating in the atmosphere. Um, and so you might notice that what's accumulating in the atmosphere is less than half of what we are putting into the atmosphere, right? And so the rest of that, about 55, 60% is getting taken up by terrestrial ecosystems, mostly our forests, and then also getting dissolved in, in our oceans, right? So these are really important ecosystem services that, that these components of, of sort of the biosphere is playing and helping to sort of slow the rate of, of climate change. Um, but I guess what sort of keeps me on land is that a lot of these interannual variations of how much is accumulated in the atmosphere is really being driven by how well our forests are, are taking up that carbon, how fast they're, they're growing. And so this is on a, on a global scale. You'll notice even in a couple of years, our, our forests are actually a source of carbon to the atmosphere. And really what's driving that, these are El Nino years where maybe you hear on the news there are these droughts and wildfires all over the place. And those droughts and those wildfires are pr producing producing and releasing enough carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that it's capable of, of 
uh, totally inundating the capacity of the rest of the forest on the planet to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, and so understanding what drives those up and downs from year to year is one of the things that, that really uh, excites me, I guess. Um, and so it's a lot of bi biology involved here, right? This is, this is photosynthesis that we're, that we're talking about. And those processes are, that are helping us to mitigate climate change are also really sensitive to uh, changes in climate and the climate conditions that, that exist. Um, so who's heard this term, charismatic megaflora, megafauna, sorry? Right, so, so the, um, I, when I was in, in grad school, I had um, some friends that were studying things like moose and lynx up in northern Maine, and they had all these nice charismatic pictures when they were giving presentations of, of what they can show people to get them really engaged and excited about what they're doing. Um, and I was always jealous that they had this cool term. And then, I don't know, maybe two years ago, I heard um, a tree person give a talk, and he was talking about um, charismatic megaflora. Right? So now we're talking about the charismatic plants, big plants, so trees. And when I think about that, um, in my mind, there's, there's probably no tree that emulates us more than the sugar maple. Right? They're, they're big, they're, they're beautiful. Um, they produce this really wonderful eye candy in the fall, and then this really delicious like mouth candy in the, in the late winter. Um, they're, they're great for wildlife. They're a huge part of, of our forests in the Catskills and then more broadly in the, in the northeastern US. Um, and so they have my attention, and I have a little bit of an obsession with maple syrup, so if I have an opportunity to study the thing that produces maple syrup, I'm all for that. Um, so, now thinking about the forests um, in the Catskills, as I'm sure all of you know, the Catskills, wonderfully so, is almost entirely forest, right? And so I have outlined here the boundaries of the, the Neversink watershed, uh, which is also heavily forested. This is just a land cover map. Everything that's green, that's forest. Yellow is, is agriculture. Different shades of red are different areas of, of development. And these forests um, are obviously really important economically to the region, both in terms of forest products and the way that they drive tourism. Uh, and this is true really throughout much of the northeastern US. They also play a really important role in climate moderation, which maybe if most of you are, live in the area, you might not fully appreciate. But if you went to New York City that didn't have any forests, you would fully appreciate how well this forest here moderate climate. And I'll show some slides on that in a minute. And they also play an important role in helping to sort of maintain air and water quality. And I'll, I'll discuss that as well. Um, so I, I like to use um, cartoons a lot, and I'm a terrible drawer, but when you make presentations in PowerPoint, you can use like sort of kind of homemade images to, uh, to, to make your cartoons. So I just wanted to go through a couple of slides and, and just talk about the different ecosystem services that trees and forests play and, and sort of how they do that and how they're doing this at local scales and, and then to global scales. Um, so thinking about climate, right? So um, Obviously, trees provide shade, right? That's an, obviously, an obvious cooling benefit of them. Um, but they also do a lot of cooling by releasing water into the atmosphere. And so this process is called transpiration, and it's pretty much analogous to when you're sweating on a hot day and a breeze comes by and you can feel that coolness on, on your skin. What's making you cool is the evaporation of water. And so trees, by transpiring, are, they're essentially allowing the, the Earth's surface to sweat and cool off. And this, this is a really important component of how they cool the, the area around them. Um, they also cool things globally by removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and trying to reduce the amount of those greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And then the other thing they do is they're really important in taking up nitrogen, right? And, and so this is really important from a stream water uh, or it, really any water quality perspective because if you have too much nitrogen going into your waterways, you get eutrophication. And what that eutrophication is, is a surge of nutrients that allows things like algae to proliferate. That process then, uh, once you have those algae pro pro uh, proliferate and then they start to die, things decompose them. That decomposition process consumes oxygen that's in the water, and that means that other things that need a lot of oxygen, like trout, don't have it available to them. And in some places, like in the Gulf of Mexico, this is particularly bad, and you get these hypoxic zones where no fish can live for part of the year because there's so much nitrogen going in there from agricultural runoff. And of course, that's an extreme case, but you can see this even 
even in, in local scales, especially if you go into um, maybe a suburban area where people are putting fertilizer on their lawns during certain times of the year, those small streams can become eutrophic. Um, and, but trees help to minimize this impact by taking up a lot of that nitrogen. All right, so urban heat island. So how is this relevant to people who live in the Catskills? Um, well, so I, I don't really like the term urban. I, I, I think of it more as a community heat island effect because this can really happen at any scale. Um, this classic diagram just is sort of showing how air temperature varies from a rural area to an urban area and, and suburban landscape. And this can, this urbanization process, which I'll talk about in a second, can have a really important impact on the temperatures that you feel. So for example, New York City is anywhere between five and 10 degrees warmer than it would be if it was still covered in forest the way it was 400 years ago. Um, but who here has a driveway? Reasonable most, okay. So you have like a mini urban heat island going on right by your house. It doesn't have to happen at the scale of a city. It can happen at the scale of a, of a driveway as well. And you probably feel this on a warm summer day. If you're walking barefoot on your driveway, it might hurt your feet quite a bit and you jump off and you go onto the grass and you feel a whole lot better. So that's a little mini urban heat island. So how does this work? Um, so here I have my urban area, some city, city skyline, but imagine it being your driveway or your house or the shopping center you go to. Um, so the source of all the energy and all the heat on the earth is ultimately from solar energy. And then it's really how these different systems sort of parse out and what they do with that energy that de is determining sort of that temperature that you feel. Um, and I'm gonna throw some numbers on here. The numbers aren't important, but I would just like you to glance back and forth between what those numbers look like for the forest versus our urban area. So first, in cities, and this part is really more specific to like a big urban area, but um, air conditioning, actually this works in your house too. If you have an air conditioning unit, right? If you go outside by your air conditioning unit when it's on, there's a lot of heat being dumped, right? And, and if you have enough people doing that in a small enough area, that can actually have an impact on, on temperature. Um, then there's this thing called albedo, which is how much of the incoming radiation from the sun gets reflected back into the atmosphere. Right, and uh, so this is in, in a forested area, it's about 14%, which is about five times what it is in an urban area. So that means those urban areas or your driveway is absorbing five times the amount of energy from the sun than maybe your lawn or your forest might be. And then there's this other piece, evapotranspiration. That's what I was just talking about, where the trees are, are sort of sweating. And the amount of that is at least twice as high in sort of your rural forested area than it is in a city or than it is right over your driveway. And then there's differences in sort of what we call sensible heat. So that's the heat that you can feel, that's the energy you can feel. Um, and it's about 25% higher in the city than it is in uh, a, a rural area. But what's really important is how much energy these two different systems store. Right? So there's not a whole lot of storage of energy in our rural areas and in our forests. And that's why at night, if you're out of the city, it's gonna cool off a whole lot more than it will if you're, if you're in a city or if you're just standing maybe right on top of your driveway because the cities will store five times the amount of heat and energy than our rural areas do. And these dynamics are really important, not just thinking about New York City, but just thinking about how we decide to develop even rural landscapes moving forward, the materials that we use and, and things along those lines. So like I said, this can be important at a variety of different scales. It doesn't just need to be you know, someplace like New York. Okay, and just to give you an idea of, of how important this evapotranspiration piece is, the amount of energy that it takes to evaporate two centimeters, so a little less than an inch of rainwater, is the same amount of energy that it would take to raise a one and a half meter cube, which is about one and a half uh, uh, cubes, uh, one and a half yards, uh, cubic yards, uh, 20 degrees Fahrenheit, right? So just evaporating this amount of water, if that, if that water's not there, it will change the temperature of a block of concrete outside by about 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And so this is a big reason why losing that ev evapotranspiration in any sort of developed area plays such an important role in how hot things get.
Okay, now here's a cool thermal image of a, a city street, or it could be even a street in, in, a, in a suburb, where basically the darker, the, the red, those warmer colors, that's a much hotter surface, and the blues and the greens are much cooler surfaces. And so this isn't um, taken with like um, any sort of image, the image is just, or what's making the colors is just how hot this, the surface of these things are. And so you can very clearly make out the hot road versus the cool trees, right? So even at a small scale, you can cool things off just by putting more trees there. Okay, so, so like I mentioned, obviously the Catskills is really highly forested, but it does have its little pockets of urban heat island. And so um, here's an image that I, I just um, had a, a student of mine pull together yesterday using data from a, a new satellite that sits on the International Space Station. Um, this cool satellite can measure the temperature at the Earth's surface at a resolution of about 70 yards by 70 yards in, in each one of those pixels. And then we can then look at spatial variations in how hot the Earth's surface is. Um, this image here, all of the, the, uh, the blue that you're seeing, that's clouds, right? The tops of clouds are really cold, and so they show up as really cold. Um, but the different yellows and, and reds, those are different temperatures uh, associated with different land covers within, within the Catskill. So um, while the entire area is pretty heavily forested, you can easily pick out the urban area. So this is like sort of the fringes of of Kingston and, and the Woodstock area, and then here's a uh, you know, corridor of, of roads and, and, some, and some development. So it doesn't take very much to really alter the temperature at that local scale. Um, and so these aren't things that we typically think about outside of a city, but like I said, they can happen anywhere. Um, and so the, the Catskill forests, um, like all of our forests really in northeastern US, are a net sink for carbon. That means that they're taking more carbon out of the atmosphere than they release back into the atmosphere through processes like, like respiration. And the way that works is primarily right through photosynthesis. This is taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, but forests, trees, ecosystems, they respire just like humans do. Every time we exhale, we're releasing carbon dioxide. Organisms that live in the forest uh, do the same thing. And so the amount of, of carbon that these systems are actually able to sequester is really just the small difference between these two values. And so these numbers are for uh, a place in New Hampshire that I'll talk about in a little bit, but the numbers are pretty similar here. And you can see that while photosynthesis takes a huge amount of carbon out of the atmosphere, sort of the cost for doing business means that a whole lot is going back into the atmosphere. And so it's really just, you know, a, 10% of all the photosynthesis, that's all that's staying, right? So if you own a business, you know that if you sell a product for $10, you don't just get to keep those, that $10, right? That goes to paying rent, paying electricity, paying employees, and paying for the product that you just sold, and maybe you're left with a couple of bucks after that. And a forest is really the, the same way. Uh, and, and as I mentioned earlier, these two processes are really sensitive to climate conditions. And so this is one of the reasons why myself and a lot of other scientists are really interested in understanding how changes in climate might affect the capacity of forests to perform a, a wide range of ecosystem services, including uh, carbon sequestration. But another reason to study the way carbon moves through an ecosystem is that it sort of provides a pretty good barometer for kind of the health of the ecosystem. Just like uh, when we go to the doctor and someone uh, looks at the, the chemistry in our, in our blood, they're not physically looking at our different organisms, but you can learn a lot about how the body's functioning by looking at the blood. So we sort of use that analogy here for forests. By looking at the way carbon's moving through a system, we can get an idea of sort of how healthy that system is. Um, and then, as I mentioned, um, forests are really important for, for water quality. And in the Catskills, over the past 40 years or so, there's been some issues with, with water quality and nitrogen running off into waterways. Early on, this was because of acid rain. Um, but more recently, as land gets developed or there's agriculture or different types of, of, of um, runoff, it could be because nitrogen that was in the soil is not being taken up by plants and trees, and it's going out into the, into the waterways. All right, so as I'm sure everyone in this room knows, the climate in our region is, is changing. And the projections are that by the end of the century, this region will be about five degrees Celsius warmer than it was um, you know, 40 years ago. Um, so five degrees Celsius, that's about eight or so degrees Fahrenheit. 
um, which puts us, gives us summers that are probably more similar to Southern Virginia than they are to the, maybe the nice cooler climate that we might be used to in the Catskills. Um, and precipitation is also expected to change. Um, and I guess yesterday was a really good example of that, right? There's, there's a lot of indication that these extreme events is gonna, are gonna increase, um, but the, the winters and the spring are expected to get a bit wetter. That's indicated by the darker blues, but our summers aren't really expected to see much of a change. Um, and so uh, what this means is that um, our winters are going to get warmer and wetter, which probably means less snow and more precipitation, so a reduced proportion of our precipitation falling as snow. And our summers, while the precipitation is not changing, because it's getting hotter, there'll be more evaporation, and that will make the, the soils and the forests effectively drier than, than they are now, or at least there's a higher likelihood for that, um, particularly towards the end of the growing season. And so the, the, historically, the way um, forest ecologists and ecologists in general have gone about trying to understand how ecosystems respond to climate change is really to focus on the growing season, right? So this is the time of year when the, when the leaves are out, when you can plant in your garden, um, because that's sort of perceived when most of the action is happening biologically. And there's been a bit of work looking at this in forests of the northeastern US. And what some of that work has shown is that a warmer and longer growing season could lead to faster tree growth, a greater capacity for the trees to take up nitrogen, um, and also because the soils get warmer, the fungi and bacteria that live in the soil can break down the organic matter that's in there, so the leaves, things like that. That releases nutrients, the trees can take that up, that helps to facilitate faster growth. Um, but as you know, if you've spent many winters up here, that snow can actually be an important part of, of, our, of our forest. And actually about 50% of the total amount of carbon that gets taken up by forests globally happens in areas that receive seasonal snow cover. Um, but for a long time, ecologists didn't really think about the importance of that in driving how productive or how healthy our forests are. Um, for throughout the Northern Hemisphere, snowpack has been declining, and this is projected to continue throughout the uh, rest of the 21st century. By the end of the 21st century, um, the uh, amount of snow cover in the Northern Hemisphere might decline by 30% or so. Um, but the year-round ecological implications of snowpack have really only been recently appreciated by, by ecologists. And, and so we start to think a little bit more now about how a decline in snowpack might uh, impact ecosystems. And so, okay, I spent a lot of time talking about snow. So why might snow be so important, right? We think of the winter as kind of like the dormant season. There's not a whole lot going on. Why does it, why does it matter? Um, well, snow is a really great insulator. Who's been built a snow shelter as a kid or maybe even as, as an adult? Um, and then you crawl inside and if you hang out there for a little bit, it probably feels a bit warmer than it does outside of your snow shelter, at least if you built a good snow shelter. Um, and, and so uh, indigenous peoples have taken advantage of this uh, property of snow for a long time. In fact, in the Arctic, even with it being maybe 50 below zero outside, if you have a few people inside of one of these igloos, the temperature can get up to be about 40 degrees. And that's because um, the heat emanating from our body is now being retained by that little igloo. And so when you hear people talk about the nice blanket of snow outside, um, it sort of functions just like maybe a down blanket would, and it helps to keep whatever's beneath it warm. And so we call that area the, the subnivian, the area beneath the snow. And so, so how does it work? Um, so here's my pretty bad cartoon of a, of, a, of a forest that looks like maybe a little bit like a, a Charlie Brown tree or something like that. Um, but what we find is that when a snowpack gets deeper than 20 centimeters, which is about eight inches, then the snowpack starts to decouple the soil temperature from the air temperature. Meaning that if you get really cold air temperatures, the soils beneath it don't really change, the temperature doesn't really change very much. And the way that works is, so you have this nice blanket of snow, you have all of this warmth in the soil that's accumulated throughout the growing season, and it leaves really slowly through the snowpack. But when we lose that snowpack, that heat can leave much more quickly, 
the temperature of the soil becomes much more tightly coupled with the temperature of the air, and as a result, our soils are more likely to freeze. So this winter, if we should get a good snowpack uh, and it doesn't come too late, uh, and if you have nothing better to do, go outside, brush away some of that snow, dig a little hole in the soil, and I'll bet you'll find that the soil's not frozen even if it's really cold outside. And then maybe do that again in a year when the snowpack comes late and we get some cold air and the soils will be frozen, and you'll be cursing me for telling you to try and dig into um, frozen ground because it's not very much fun. Um, so we've done some modeling work to see over the next century how is the, the likelihood, what's the likelihood of that insulating snowpack going to be um, over the next, at this point, 80 years? And so this figure on the left is, is the historical likelihood that you have an insulating snowpack. Um, and so the darker the blue indicates the higher the likelihood, right? And, and the Catskills are all, in many of these images, are sort of like an island that sticks out, right? It's, it's elevation puts it in a climate zone that's maybe more similar to part of the Catskills or the Green Mountains or the, or the White Mountains. And so historically, much of the Catskills um, would often have a, a deep insulating snowpack by the middle of the winter. Um, but by the end of the century, we find that the likelihood that that insulating snowpack will be here will decline substantially. Um, and actually, throughout the whole northeastern U.S., we find that this decline is pretty pervasive. And by the year 2100, about 95% of the current forest cover that experiences, is, that experiences an insulating snowpack will no longer have that insulating snowpack. Um, so this is potentially a pretty big, pretty big change. Uh, and so what we've been asking, myself and, and, and colleagues, people who have come before me in this field, really over the last 20 years, is ecologically, does this matter? If you lose the snowpack and soils are more likely to freeze, does it matter? And so I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story, I guess, over the next handful of slides here about um, a few different iterations of experiments that have been conducted at Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest, which is um, owned by the Forest Service. And it's up in the White Mountains in New Hampshire. Has anyone been up to the White Mountains in New Hampshire? It's a really beautiful place. They get lots of snow there. It's a good place to do these sort of climate manipulation experiments. But really, the Catskills down here are much more sort of on the front line of these changes in climate. They're going to be, this is going to be the region that's going to lose its snowpack before the, the White Mountains do. But the forest type is similar. Many of the aspects of the climate are similar. And so a lot of the information that we learn from these experiments at Hubbard Brook also likely uh, translate to what we might expect to happen through much of the, the Catskills. Um, so the great thing about Hubbard Brook, well, there's, there's a, a, few, a, lot, well, a lot of great things. But so Hubbard Brook became famous because it's the place in North America where acid rain was first discovered. Right? And, and so they have this long-term data record going back to the 50s where they've been measuring things like stream water chemistry and flow rates and air temperature and snow depth. And it's this really great data set. I often um, tell people, um, especially if I know if there, there's any people from Brooklyn in the crowd, that, that Hubbard Brook is sort of like, like the hipster for winter climate change work because they've been doing it since before it was cool. Um, but, but I mean, they've been doing it for a long time before we, like, like this idea of climate change even existed, they've been making these measurements to uh, where we can now definitively see that the climate in that region has changed. And we can see how the snowpack has changed. And there are very few places in the world that have that long of a record. Um, and so you can see clearly here that the average winter uh, air temperatures have increased um, just in that 60-year uh, period pretty considerably. And this is two different elevations. So this is the uh, higher elevation. This is the, the lower elevation. But in both places, there's been a couple degrees Celsius increase in, in temperature. And with that increase in winter temperature, there's been a decline in snowpack in all of the different ways that, that we measure it. So um, on the top, it's the maximum snow depth. That's been declining over time. And it's been declining uh, in that time period by about uh, 20 centimeters in terms of what the maximum snowpack is. The amount of water in the snow has also been declining. And the number of days each year when there's snow on the ground 
that's also been declining by about 20 days. Um, and so there's few places where we have this long of a record where you can kind of get out of the noise, right? As you know, there's a lot of variability from year to year in how much snow we get, how long it stays on the ground, and you really need a long-term data set to pick up any sort of pattern in that. Oh, I should mention, feel free to ask me questions at any point as I'm going through this if, if something I'm saying doesn't make sense. Um, the other thing that they've observed there, I mentioned that they have this long record of streamwater chemistry, is that the amount of nitrate that gets exported in streams, so nitrate is a form of nitrogen that's particularly mobile. The ecosystems don't retain it very well unless trees take it up, and uh, it's an important driver of eutrophication and other water quality issues. Um, what they find is that as sort of the mean air temperature increases, the amount of nitrate getting exported to the streams increases. And this is particularly striking for the winter, right? Warmer winters see much larger increases in nitrate than if you were to just look at sort of the mean for the year, right? So this is suggesting that changes in winter climate could potentially have an important impact on things like water quality. Um, and then going back to the 60s, you can look at the, the uh, stream chemistry record, and there's a couple of things. First, you see this nice decline in the amount of nitrogen being exported to the streams. This is thanks to legislation that uh, curbed um, things related to acid rain. But then you also see these periodic spikes. And while it's not entirely clear what causes those spikes, some of those spikes happen to occur the same years when there were severe soil frost events. So maybe there was like a snow failure and there was a cold snap, you get the soil freezing, and then for whatever reason that increases export of, of nitrogen. Um, and then in the late 90s, there was a big ice storm that breaks off a lot of twigs, branches, um, and then the decomposition of that can result in a lot of uh, nitrogen being exported to the stream. So climate has a really important role in that, in that water quality piece. So these forests up there are, are sugar maple dominated northern hardwood forest, which is not that different than a lot of the forests here, especially once you get up a little bit in elevation. Um, and I, don't, I usually show this picture to my students in New York City that probably don't have a good mental image of what a, a northern hardwood forest looks like. I'm sure um, you guys know quite well what, what that looks like, especially in the fall. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, right, this is where all of our maple syrup comes from, and I keep highlighting that because um, I usually this point in the talk, talking about uh, sugar maples, I start to crave like a little maple sugar candy or something. Um, and so this region gets a continuous snowpack from December through early April. Um, much of the Catskills gets a continuous snowpack, maybe for a little bit shorter period of, of time, but the overall dynamics aren't that different. And so, so what do we do? So when we try to mimic a change in the snowpack, um, basically you underpay graduate students to go out <laughs> into the woods with some shovels and remove snow every time, every time the, the snow comes. For the, we, did, we do this for the first five or six weeks of winter. And so at the time I was uh, in my early 30s and I got to call my parents and say, hey, I'm making money the same way now as I did when I was 12. And um, so of course that makes them really proud and feel like they did a really good job as, as parents. But it is, a, it is a, a, a lot of fun. So we have um, plots throughout the forest where we go out there, we remove the snow, um, to sort of mimic kind of a later onset and reduced depth of that winter snowpack. The first of these sorts of experiments was done in, in the late 90s. Um, and then in 2008, we started sort of a second iteration of these experiments to answer some questions that weren't answered from the first time around. And so um, this is data from just one year, but we see the same patterns every year. So we, st we stick these um, fancy high-tech little soil frost gauges in, in the soil. Um, we fill these, these clear flexible PVC tubes with what's called methylene blue dye. That's the blue stuff here. The nice thing about it is that when it freezes, it's clear. Um, and so when we have these in the ground, we can go out there, pluck them out of the soil, we have a, a little line where our soil surface is, and we can measure how deep that soil frost is penetrating, right? And these cost like a few bucks to make, so it's a nice, cheap way to, to get these data. Um, and then we do this, we make these measurements weekly throughout the winter, and then we can compare how these dynamics vary between the plots we've been shoveling and the plots we didn't do anything to. 
So everything above zero is the snow depth. Everything below zero is the soil frost depth. The open symbols are the plots where we just let the snowpack be. And the closed symbols are where we remove the snow. And you can see pretty quickly that once we started removing snow, there's a divergence in how deep the soil freezes, right? In our reference plots where we didn't remove snow, it's really just like a couple of centimeters of, of soil frost. But in the plots where we did remove snow, it can get, in this year, it got as deep as about 30 centimeters. There's been some years where it's gotten as deep as 50 centimeters. Um, for perspective, most of the roots in the soil are in about the top 30 centimeters. Of, of the soil. Um, so this sort of treatment means that pretty much the entire area where the roots are, are, um, are getting frozen for some part of the winter. And so um, a colleague of mine is now at, at CUNY. Um, this, this was the first paper that came out of these experiments. And, and it was a nice little paradox that you could potentially have colder soils in a warmer world. And that was um, precisely because of this dynamic. The warmer conditions would keep snowpack from accumulating, but we can still get um, periodic cold snaps. Those cold snaps would suppress soil temperatures and make it freeze. Um, and so what they found is that that soil freezing would actually kill roots. Um, and the way that happens is the same way that potholes get formed in our streets in, in the winter, right? So the, the physical freezing and expansion of water in the soil abrades, breaks up, kills, damages the roots that are, that are there. Um, with the roots being damaged or killed, they don't have the same capacity to take up nitrogen. And so the hypothesis was that all this increase in nitrogen coming out of the soils was because these roots were being killed. Uh, fast forward 10 years, and there was another experiment set up at Hubbard Brook, where now they set, to, they set out to um, try and figure out why exactly you were losing more nitrogen. And what they found was that, indeed, not only are roots more likely to get killed, but the ones that live are damaged. Right, like protective coating of the roots um, gets damaged a bit, and th the roots start becoming leaky. Uh, and they find that the increase in nitrogen leaching was because the roots couldn't take nitrogen up. And this is particularly important in sort of this vernal window, the time of year when the snowpack is melting and when trees start becoming active again. Um, there's a lot of nitrogen that accumulates in that snowpack all winter long. And if the roots aren't active that time of year to take that nitrogen up, it just comes right out into our streams. And so that's a really sensitive time of year. And that's the time when the, the, when the roots were most damaged and had the reduced, uh, reduced capacity to take up that nitrogen. Um, so the damaged roots reduces nitrogen uptake, which is a really important nutrient. We're finding that it reduces the capacity of trees to take up water. And that seems to have important impacts on the physiology of the trees. So shoot elong elongation was, was shorter. So um, each year, the growing tips of a branch elongate. And they don't do that as much when their roots are damaged. And the, the chemistry of the leaves was um, getting adversely impacted as well. And so one of the ways scientists measure this is the ratio of calcium to aluminum. Aluminum is toxic. And so as aluminum increases or calcium decreases, that ratio will change. And that can impair the functioning of the leaves. So there were all of these indicators that um, Decline in snowpack and soil freezing was adversely impacting different aspects of tree physiology, but we didn't really know if it had an impact on tree growth. And so what, what we did um, a few years later with um, a really ambitious undergraduate student at Boston University who wanted to do her senior thesis project collecting tree cores, she's like this tall. and. Collecting a core from a sugar maple tree is really, really difficult, especially for her when she had to do it at like her head height. Um, but she was, she was, she was great. We went out into the into the mountains. Um, we did this after five years of removing snow for the for the winter, um, and then we waited an additional year where we didn't do anything to the forest to see if the trees could recover after that. And we collected these tree cores brought them back to the lab, processed them. We can use the tree cores to figure out how much the tree grew in any given year, and then see if their growth rates changed after we started the experiment relative to before they started the experiment. Um, 
And so um, what, we, what we found is, my symbols always get messed up when I do this on a PC, but uh, the squares in this case are our reference plots, the black dots are our snow removal plots. We look at 10 years before we started the experiment, and um, then we look at growth rates relative to that mean growth rate for that 10 year sort of pre-treatment period. And you can see before, the 10 years before our experiment, our, our trees and our reference plots and our trees and our experimental plots sort of behave the same way. But once we started removing snow, um, pretty quickly after um, we initiated that experiment, there's this huge decline in growth in our snow removal plots that uh, amounts to about a 40% decline in sugar maple growth, and it's got as low as 55% um, towards the end of the experiment. Uh, and so my gray shaded area doesn't show up here. This is when we stop removing snow, so this is after a year of just sort of ambient snow conditions, and the trees in our experimental plots don't bounce back, right? So it suggests that once they sort of suffer from this soil freezing damage, it takes them at least several years um, for them to fully recover and, and resume their normal growth rates. Um, I should point out, that, what's that? So we would need to go back out and collect cores again. So this is what I would like to do at, at some point and see, you know, I, I had expected to see some indication that the trees would bounce back, but we didn't. And so now it's been another uh, four years or so. Um, it would be great to go back, core these trees again and see if they show any sign of, of increase. Um, so yeah, one of these days it would be nice to take a, a, a trip up there to, to do that. But unfortunately, um, we didn't have that for this, for this study. Uh, oh wait, so you're probably looking at this and wondering why our, the, the growth in our reference plots seemed to tank in this one year and then bounce back. So um, in spring of 2010, this happened here too, uh, and maybe you remember this, there was um, a, early warm up in the spring. So early spring temperatures were three degrees Celsius above normal throughout the northeastern US. So that's about uh, five or so degrees Fahrenheit. What this did is that it triggered the common tree species, yellow, yellow birch, American beech, and sugar maple to uh, start leafing out quite a bit earlier than normal. And this was particularly true for sugar maple, which seems to be a little bit more opportunistic to these sorts of conditions. Um, and so here's a map showing all the areas in the Northeast where this frost event happened. All the negative signs indicate where there was frost. So it was pretty much the whole area. And this is what it looked like at, at Hubbard Brook. It probably didn't look that much different at some of the um, mid and higher elevations here in the Catskills, where you got these um, sugar maple leaves that got hit by this frost, got damaged, they died, they fell off. And so you had areas in uh, sort of mid or late May that maybe looked a lot more like they would at the end of, of April. And so what we found is that um, we've been measuring the uh, foliar biomass in our plots uh, for a few years. And in 2008 and 2009, before that frost event, both plots sort of behaved the same in terms of how much leaf biomass they had. But in the year when there was that spring frost event, everybody had fewer leaves, right? Because they lost them all and had to put out another flush. But our snow removal plots, this white bar, wasn't able to put out sort of the same amount of leaf as our reference plots, which sort of suggests that that soil freezing, not only does it sort of damage the tree directly, but it seems to reduce the capacity of the trees to be able to withstand additional environmental stressors, in this case, a late spring frost event. And so that's what you're seeing here. All the trees declined in growth because they lost a lot of their leaves, but very quickly, the trees in our reference plots bounce back, um, but the trees that had been suffering from soil freezing had no capacity to bounce back at all. And if anything, they just, their growth rates continued to decline. So then we, we took that information for how sugar maples respond to these changes in winter climate, and we paired that with our projections for how snowpack might change by the end of the century. 
and we used um, forest inventory and analysis data. Is anyone familiar with that database? So it's, uh, it's an amazing data set uh, that's uh, administered by the US Forest Service, where they have over 100,000 forested plots throughout the US that get measured every five or 10 years, depending on what state you're in. And so it creates this really nice long-term database of how much forest biomass there is, what tree species are there, and all sorts of other information. It's all freely available. You can go to their website and download whatever you want. We use that database to figure out the distribution of sugar maple throughout the Northeast and where it was most common. The resolution here isn't very good, um, but not surprising, um, Vermont has a lot of sugar maple, the Catskills have a lot of sugar maple, the Adirondacks do, parts of New Hampshire and, and parts of Maine. Um, and so what we did is we looked at where there's sugar maple, we looked at where the snowpack's declining, and we could come up with a, with a map of where there might still be forest by the end of the century that will experience this deep snowpack. And it goes from this light green area to really just the dark green. So like I said, it's a really large decline in the area of forest that's gonna have that insulating snowpack. Um, and when we tie into that, uh, where we have a lot of sugar maple, we can come up with this sort of index for how vulnerable our forest might be to changes in winter climate conditions that reduce the amount of, of snow. Um, and so this map on the left is showing uh, the decline in winter snowpack moving forward. So the dark browns are about a 70% decline in snowpack. And then on the right, the brighter the red indicates forest that we expect to be more vulnerable, vulnerable, ah, vulnerable based on its species composition and sort of where it lies in, in terms of how much its snowpack is expected to decline. Um, and so parts of the Adirondacks, the Green Mountains, and then also the Catskills fit in there. Um, and that's again, it's a function of the amount of sugar maple in the Catskills as well as projected declines in snowpack. Um, and so there's all these important ecosystem services that forests play, but when we put out this paper, the thing that lots of places latched onto was how it could impact maple syrup production. And, and, and so, you know, we had like, um, someone from the New York Times reached out to us and someone from the Maple News. And there weren't really these questions about climate regulation or nitrogen retention. It was, how is this gonna impact maple syrup production? So I normally list things like climate and carbon and nitrogen as important ecosystem services, but perhaps I need to add maple syrup to that too, because that's a thing that really uh, excites people. All right, so um, historically, when, when we would talk about those data, someone in the audience would inevitably ask, but all you're doing is changing the winter climate. The growing season climate's supposed to change too, and it's supposed to get warmer. How are the interactions between these going to impact forest health moving forward? And so in 2012, we got funding to do that sort of experiment. Um, and we call it, I'll show you in a second, we call it the climate change across seasons experiment. And we try to induce these changes in growing season climate and, we, and these changes in, in winter climate. And this is just a brief summary in sort of how those separate changes in climate might affect uh, trees and, and the forest. Um, and so, like I said, we're trying to figure out, figure out well, what's the net effect of those, of those changes? Because people have historically focused on this aspect of climate, just the growing season. And then over the past, you know, since the late 1990s, we've focused on this part, but now we need to sort of bring them together. And so for this experiment, um, this is what we call a multifactorial experiment. We did this at Hubbard Brook as well. Um, where we're exploring the interactive effects of uh, growing season soil warming and increased soil freezing during, uh, during the winter. And so um, normally we would like to warm the entire forest, but trees are really large and budgets are really limited. And so we don't really have the capacity to fully warm a forest where trees can be 70 or 80 feet tall. Um, so what we do instead is we change sort of the, the soil climate condition and we watch how things respond because a lot of what the trees respond to um, is driven by what's happening in the soil. Not everything, but part of it. Um, and we set up uh, these plots that are 11 meters by 14 meters. And what's important to note here, and I'll come back to this later, is we wanted to have plots that were centered on sugar maple trees. 
But for logistical reasons, like where were we able to get power out into the woods, we, we had to just sort of resign ourselves to having plots focus on red maples. Um, and I'll show you later why this might be important. Um, and so uh, the way we do this is, uh, does anyone have radiant floor heating in their, in their home? Um, and so have you, have you seen them put it in and, and you have like your, your cement slab and they, and they sort of uh, drew the, um, the heating cable through, through the floor. We use that same exact heating cable except we lace it through the, the forest soil uh, to create that warming effect. Uh, and then one of our colleagues went out with a thermal camera and you can see the, the stripes where the, where the heating cables are. And so we have all this attached to a fancy thermostat that can help us keep the soil temperature five degrees Celsius or about eight degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the soils outside of our plots are. And this is again to simulate what we think or expect the climate will be like here uh, by the end of the century. Um, and then in, in our other plots, we introduced a series of freezing and thawing cycles, right? So we had reference plots where we did nothing, we had plots where we just warmed, and then we had plots where we warmed it during the growing season, and then during the winter, we did freezing and thawing cycles. The way we would do that is we would uh, briefly remove snow, turn on the heating cables to thaw the soils, turn them off, the soils would freeze, um, and then we turn the cables back on to thaw them, and we can sort of reproduce uh, freezing and thaw cycles. And then here's some soil temperature data that essentially shows that we were able to accomplish what we had hoped to, which is always encouraging. Um, the black line is our reference plots that we didn't do anything to. The yellow line is just the plots that were warm. So during the winter, their temperature is the same as our reference plots, but um, just after snow melt, when we flip on the, uh, the heating cables, you can see they keep themselves about five degrees Celsius warmer than our reference plots. And then the blue line, those are the plots where we also introduce the freezing and thawing cycles. And you can see those here, those ups and downs in temperature that's going through the freezing and thawing. And so we've been measuring a whole lot of things in these plots. This, this study is still going on. We've been looking at microbial processes in the soil. We've been looking at photosynthesis. We've been looking at safflo, which is how quickly and how much water is flowing through the trees. We've been looking at how much carbon dioxide is coming out of the trees. We've been looking at uh, above ground net primary productivity, which is just how fast the trees in the forest is growing. We've been looking at uh, soil respiration, which is carbon dioxide coming out of the soil. It's the largest source of carbon dioxide in an, in an ecosystem. And we've also been looking at nitrogen dynamics in the soil. Um, okay, so from our previous work, we know that a decline in snowpack and the soil freezing uh, could have any number of impacts on rates of soil respiration. We know that it can reduce nitrogen uptake and increase nitrogen losses, and we know that it can reduce uh, tree growth. From experiments I just did, the warming, we know that it can increase rates of soil respiration, so the amount of carbon dioxide coming out of the system. It can increase nitrogen uptake and it can increase tree growth, right? So there are some opposing factors here, and again, we wanted to see if we add these two together, how does the forest respond? So to look at how quickly the trees are growing, we do two things. We put out what we call litter baskets, which is a laundry basket. We put that out into the woods. It captures all the leaves that come down, and that's how we measure how much foliar biomass there is. And then to look at tree growth, we uh, get this um, uh, aluminum tape material, and we get these fancy springs, and we attach the spring to the tape. These little holes are there. As the tree grows, these points move further apart from one another, and then we can measure continuously how fast the trees are growing. So what did we find? Um, so I'm gonna show you data from 2013 to 2017. We have more recent data. The patterns haven't changed at all. Um, and I'll show you a few lines, the reference plots, the warm plots, which are the black triangles that I'll show you in a second, and then the black circles are the uh, ones that also receive the freezing and thawing in the winter. So there's not much of a pattern over time in our reference plots and the amount of uh, leaf biomass that the, uh, the, that the trees are producing. Um, in our warm plots, we see that there's an increase in the amount of foliar biomass that they're producing, and that increase is about 17%. But that gets completely offset when we throw the freezing and thawing cycles at them. So any benefits that you seem to get from warming get offset by freezing in the winter. 
When we look at how quickly the trees are growing, um, so this is the amount of cumulative biomass that the trees are, are putting on. We use this term basal area increment, which um, basal area is the cross-sectional area of, of a tree, and the basal area increment is like the little donut of wood that it's putting on each year. If we sum that over time, that's what these lines represent. Um, and so all, this, all these numbers are relative to 2014. Uh, when we warm the soils, the tree growth rate doubles, right? So we get an increase in leaf area, trees can photosynthesize more, and their growth rate doubles. But almost all of that is lost when we throw the freeze-thaw cycles at them. The other thing that we were looking at is the nitrogen dynamics. Um, and so we look at the root uptake of nitrogen. We sort of just gently pull roots out of the soil, put them in a solution, and see how much of the nitrogen they take up. And we also put these little um, bags in the soil that have these little plastic beads that nitrogen attaches to, and that's how we measure how much nitrogen is, is sort of getting lost from, from the soil. Uh, and, and what we find is, so this metric here, electrolyte leakage, that's just an indicator of how damaged the roots are. So higher leakage, higher damage, lower leakage, lower damage. And then on the y-axis here, that's how much nitrogen is being taken up by the roots. And so you can see pretty clearly that there's this separation um, between the warm plots, the reference plots, and the ones that are getting the freeze-thaw cycles thrown at them. Um, and the ones with the freeze-thaw cycles, even though they're also experiencing warming in the growing season, still have a reduced capacity to take up nitrogen. And then as you might expect, if the roots can't take up as much nitrogen, then more of that nitrogen is going to get lost from the ecosystem. And here, most of that's in the form of, of ammonium, because that's the form that most nitrogen in, the, uh, in these forest soils exists. Um, so this sort of uh, suggests that while uh, freezing and thawing and warming, they seem to offset each other in terms of the pros and cons, um, from a nitrogen perspective, the freezing thawing processes win out and result in sort of a net increase in the amount of nitrogen leaving the system. So earlier I mentioned to remember that we did this study in red maple dominated forests. And all the earlier work that I showed you um, with declines in tree growth was with sugar maple. And what's important to note is that there's probably differences in how different tree species respond to these changes in climate. So this figure here is showing, again, that metric of root damage. And this is with the number of freeze-thaw cycles, so the amount of freezing the trees experience throughout the winter. And the red maples don't really respond a whole lot to that, but the sugar maples sure do. They don't, like, they don't uh, tolerate the freezing nearly as well as the red maples. Um, and so we need to think about that when interpreting uh, some of these data and what they might mean at the forest scale. Um, so what about other aspects of climate change? So also at Hubbard Brook, We've been, we have a few other climate manipulation experiments. So there's this experiment, which I just told you about. Um, we have another experiment where we're trying to simulate those drier growing season conditions. And we have another experiment called the ice experiment, um, which simulates a, an ice storm at Hubbardbrook to see how the ecosystem responds. Um, with, with these experiments, we've been uh, most recently we've been looking at a lot of things. I'm going to quickly show you just one slide of respiration data, soil respiration data. Again, this is the largest source of carbon dioxide coming out of an ecosystem, um, but it also tells us a lot about things like how the roots are functioning and how the microbes in the soil are behaving. So we can learn a lot about how broadly the ecosystem is, is functioning. Um, there's my dog being not very helpful up there in, in the back. Um, and, so, and so what we find is Here's our um, climate change across season experiment, where here's our warming plots. Here's the one that also have freezing and thawing. Here's our drought experiment. Here's our ice storm experiment. These bars are relative to the plots where we didn't do anything. So anything above the zero means that soil respiration increased in response to that uh, uh, experimental treatment. Anything below indicates that it decreased. Um, so uh, what we find is that warming increases soil respiration. The freeze-thaw cycles entirely offsets that increase. Um, for our drought experiment, for a few years, we just removed 50% of the water, and it only had a small impact. But this past year, when we upped that to 90% uh, exclusion to induce sort of extreme drought, that resulted in large declines of respiration. And again, this is likely linked to root functioning and things along those lines. And then our ice storm treatment, much to our surprise, has not had a very big impact on, on what we're seeing. Um, and so it seems that the biggest impacts will be either if we just have warming 
or we just have an extreme drought event, even if it's short, like the one that we had this past August and September might be. Um, but you know, it'd be interesting to then start looking at the interactions between warming and drought. Do these two just offset one another, or is there some synergy there? Um, and so I'm just going to finish up with this sort of summary slide of everything that I spoke about. So our classical view of thinking about how ecosystems respond to climate change would focus on a warmer growing season. And we know that those warmer conditions increase decomposition of organic material in the soil, which increases nutrient availability, which then increases tree growth. Those warmer conditions also increase soil temperature, which also increases the amount of carbon dioxide coming out of the soil. Oops. Um, and we get these bigger trees. Um, if we just look at warming winters in our region, that means uh, reduced snowpack, increased soil freezing, increased root mortality, a decline in the capacity of the trees in the forest to take up nutrients, which then results in an increase in nitrogen getting lost from the soils and a decrease in tree growth. So that's our little sad tree here. Um, and the classical approach would have us look at one of these or the other. Now, coming back to the, the theme of the talk is, well, what happens if we start connecting these seasons? And that was um, the example of, of that big climate change across seasons experiment that I mentioned, um, where it seems that when we warm during the growing season, it might increase soil respiration and tree growth, um, but that gets offset by soil freezing, right? So, so from how carbon moves through the forest, <clears throat> those two changes in climate will seem like maybe they'll offset each other. Um, and it's sort of a chicken or the egg thing, right? Is, is the warming offsetting the damage from freezing or is the freezing offsetting the stimulation by warming? I don't know the answer. Um, and then <clears throat> uh, winter soil freezing uh, seems to result in reduced capacity to take up nitrogen uh, and for the ecosystem to retain nitrogen, but that does not get offset by warming. So perhaps the bigger impact might be on uh, the nitrogen getting lost from the system. Um, and then we can start thinking about, okay, well, there's all these different changes in climate. How do they interact with one another? Um, and we just need a lot more money to study that. And then if we wanted to do something crazy, like look at more than one tree species, that also takes more resources. But there's a lot to think about here. And I'll just leave you with this. So, um, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, but what happens in winter does not stay in winter, right? What happens in winter translates to what happens uh, the rest of the year. And I would argue that by not accounting for these connections across seasons, um, this will likely impair our capacity to develop the climate change adap adaptation strategies that are necessary to help build resilient communities and industries. Here's some pictures of those. Here's picture of me and my brothers and my dad taking fly fishing lessons for his 60th birthday a while ago in the Catskills. Um, and so I'm happy to have any questions with whatever time is left.